Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. I'm Alice Lee Hagen. To start with the program, I'd like to announce um, Paul Chung, the annual Paul Chung Lecture at the Scheidler College of Business on August 12th, which is a Tuesday, at the Hawaii Prince Hotel. This is an annual lecture to honor the founder of PAMI, or the Pacific Asia Management Institute at the University of Hawaii Scheidler College of Business. Our guest uh, or our presenter for this year is Dr. Yun Dae Yu. He's the retired CEO and chairman of KB Financial Group, the largest financial group in South Korea. Uh, if you're interested in learning about the South Korean economy, please join us at the Paul Chung Lecture. And for more information and for registration, please um, visit our site at pami.scheidler.hawaii.edu. And now back to our interview today. Our title of the interview is on leadership in higher education. And I'm really honored to have Diane peters Wynn. She is the Vice President of Institutional Advancement, um, Institutional Advancement at Chaminade University. Uh, some background information about Diane. Uh, she directs all aspects of the university's inter institutional relations, development, and public relations. Since she joined Chaminade University in 2007, she assisted in the capping of the $66 million transformation campaign. She serves on uh, a lot of um, different boards at the university. She's a member of the President's Leadership Council, and she works closely with the university's Board of Governor and Regents. She's also a trustee of the Chaminade University Education Foundation. Welcome, Diane. It's great to have you here. Thanks, Alice. Thank you for having me. Well, uh, I'm looking forward to our conversation about your role as a leader at Chaminade and in the community. But uh, to start off, my first question for you would be, um, how has your former positions um, in, well, how, how has your former positions uh, prepared you for your current work here at Chaminade University? So it's funny because sometimes I say that I think I spent my whole life preparing for this position without even knowing it and when I when the opportunity became available and I looked back at the things that I had done and um, the emphasis in my life uh, always been connected with educational efforts um, I had a, a good amount of academic experience teaching languages so really at all different ages from kindergarten all the way through college at two different universities actually the UH and then in Japan and Tokai University I had also uh, had a good amount of experience on educational advisory boards and also um, educational programs at the Pacific and Asian Affairs Council. And I also had some fundraising and grant experience. So I think the combination of those things led me to look at the opportunity and say, this is it. This is what I want to do. Well, i um, glad you mentioned languages because when I looked at your bio uh, and we talked about it earlier on too, you speak a lot of languages, um, German, French, Spanish, Japanese, uh, Vietnamese. Oh, no, <laughs> I think I can say uh, I can order coffee in Vietnamese, <laughs> but um, I think it's a bit of a stretch to say that I, could, I can uh, manage uh, completely in those languages. Mm -hmm. I've got smatterings and I can say different things, but uh, it's one of those things where I, I love languages and I wish I had more time to practice them. Well, I'm always fascinated by people who actually take the time and who have the talent to speak um, different languages. Well, you're not so shabby yourself, <laughs> Alice. Can well, Cantonese, Mandarin, English, um, whatever else there might be. <laughs> that's a different story. But um, now coming back to what you mentioned that you've always been interested in education, but mm -hmm. I know that before you came to this position, as the VP of uh, Institutional Development, you were doing something else and you had um, other experiences in different industries. So tell us about that. Well, you're right. Uh, actually, before, right before I came to Chaminade, I was a co-owner uh, at the small PR company here in town and had an opportunity to really develop uh, a lot of different skill sets uh, in the communications and PR area, but also get in-depth, and, and so my clients did, I, I did have a sort of a government and public affairs piece of the, the work, which was very exciting for me. So 
part of um, what came under me was developing, for example, public awareness campaigns and public education campaigns, things like pedestrian safety and non-point source pollution uh, runoff, how to avoid that. So it was um, also at some corporate um, development types of clients, but it was a wonderful experience for me, and, and yet I still long to get back into the um, more direct educational side of things. So how has your PR experience helped you with your, um, your position then? I, because the um, institutional advancement really covers all aspects of fundraising, uh, most people associate it with the development side, but it also has a, a very key function in raising the overall visibility and, and um, you know, awareness about the university. So the director of communications comes under me and we have responsibility for it, um, both internal and external communications. And, and then, as you mentioned, other functions relate to board relations and um, community relations and so forth. You talk about visibility and I guess, um, well, I, I would imagine all the universities are concerned about that. So since you joined Chaminade in 2007 up till now, and looking back, how, how much has have you increased the visibility of Chaminade? Wow, that's a great question, and we ask ourselves that all the time. So it's a difficult thing to measure how you've increased awareness, and, and you can start with uh, surveys and do a baseline and then try to see how many more people are aware of Chaminade and, and know something about what Chaminade does. The, it's, but it is hard to put your finger exactly. So you can measure things like circulation for publications. You can measure impressions, which are how many um, people have seen a particular story. Uh, now that we have social media, we're out there on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, all of those different social media. So it's in looking at numbers, I mean, the impressions are in the mil million and million and millions but it's very hard to, to be able to tangibly say how many more people have a, a good understanding of some of the things that Shamana does. So we're, we're still struggling with that question. Uh, then uh, when you, okay, going back to measuring visibility, uh, is there something unique about um, measuring uh, visibility of higher education? Is there something unique about that um, because it's higher education as opposed to, say, for business? Well, I, I think that each industry will, will have its own sort of specific challenges mm -hmm. in, in how to raise awareness. Mm -hmm. And in, in higher education, for example, we, we talk about, you know, do we market to the parents? Or the parents need to have a good sense of what Chaminade is, that you can get a good, solid education. So one piece might be marketing directly to the parents. but. There's now uh, a lot of young people that are going right online and are picking their colleges mm -hmm. um, with, with information from the website. And they themselves are taking charge of that whole um, exploration part of, of learning about higher educational institutions. So, so our online presence is much more important than, for example, the printed materials that we might develop. Once upon a time, we, there was a thing called a view book that you sent. And, and you and you printed it up thousands mm -hmm. of copies and we don't do that anymore so it's it's a really rapidly changing world and I salute what you do here at think tech because um, in trying to get get our minds around how to use technology and how to take advantage of it it's something that we constantly are faced with absolutely and then I think back of the time when I was going to university looking uh -huh. at different universities and there's no social media you <laughs> kind of just go by okay yeah people recommend certain universities. So I would imagine it's quite challenging, even though there's social media to assist in, in branding and marketing. That's right. And you know, there's, I, I believe, about 4,000 colleges and universities throughout the country. So the, the choice is, is incredible. But what we find, you know, we're, you're at UH, mm -hmm. um, I'm at Chaminade. We just met a colleague from Hawaii Pacific University. We used to think those were our competitors, but no more. Our competitors are National Defense University, um, you know, Phoenix, other online providers that are not necessarily bricks and mortar in the community. So it, be, it becomes harder and harder to compete because these 
uh, what we are very well aware of, massive on open online courses, mm -hmm. the so-called MOOCs, MOOCs yes. now uh -huh. are tending to um, really dominate the scene in, in many ways and change the face of higher education. So it's, it's constantly changing, it's constantly a challenge, and uh, we have to run as fast as we can to keep up with it. And I'm sure it's the same. Um, we're probably going through similar experience like perhaps the banks and other industries where uh, technology and innovation are uh, impacting the way we operate so much. Exactly. Very true. Um, now, uh, coming back to you, so uh, despite all these challenges, so what do you enjoy most about what you do as a vice president at Chaminade? So I, I think probably the, the first thing that I would point to is being able to wake up every day and say, I'm doing something that matters. Mm -hmm. I am changing the lives of the students that we touch uh, one person at a time, I'm, I'm making a difference. And so um, sitting through commencement, you, you get that wonderful feeling. And I think for many people who work with the homeless, with the disadvantaged, with um, prison populations, it's, it's hard. I Honestly, I'm so in awe of those people that have to charge themselves up every day and have the strength of, of inner um, core that they can then give and become caregivers in, in health care settings or nurses or whatever it may be. For, for me, I get recharged every day, so that'd be probably the first thing that I love. Mm -hmm. the, the, and, and related to the mission also is the fact that Chaminade is a native Hawaiian serving institution. Mm -hmm. I don't look like it, but I do have Hawaiian ancestry, mm -hmm. Chinese as well, mm -hmm. and that uh, for me is an important part of our mission. So those, um, that would be the one big thing. And then the other things, that I, I just enjoy the challenges. There are no end to, you know, we just talked about some of them, but it, if I were in a job that it were just easy and it's all figured out and uh -huh. it's routine, I, I, I don't think I'd last very long. So I love the challenges. Uh -huh. And lastly, I, I have a wonderful team. I have just an incredible, dedicated, talented team of people around me that, um, make coming to work a joy. Well, um, it sounds like uh, uh, you really enjoy your position. And um, I did talk to somebody from your team, and they were really supportive. Oh, good. Now, um, <laughs> they get a raise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, maybe I can ask you a question about, um, since you do a lot of public relations in the community, you interact a lot with um, students, alumni. Um, tell us about some of your alumni uh, at Shamanat. And maybe before we do that, uh, let's take a, um, a quick, um, show quick footage of what Shamanat has been doing with or for their alumni. Um, Mr. Producer, can you roll the footage, please? Diane, tell us about your alumni at Chaminade. Well, you could see from the video that we have just a wonderful group of very engaged alumni. Uh, I think I could be fair in saying our alumni are everywhere. Mm -hmm. So from the fields of economics and finance, for example, we have the director of DBED, who's on the governor's cabinet, Richard Lim. Mm -hmm. We have uh, recently appointed co-president of Central Pacific Bank, Lance Mizumoto. CFO of Punahou, John Field, uh, Don Arioshi of Morgan Stanley, so well represented in the field of entertainment, for example. You saw on the video Sweetie Picaro of KSSK, everybody knows Frank DeLima, uh, Nahoku winner, Kuipo Kumukahi, 
um, Kumuhula Kaleo Trinidad. Um, a lot of beauty pageant winners have attended a shamanad, mm -hmm. such as um, Brooke Lee. And then in the fields of education, for example, and, and public service, uh, currently the chair of UH's Board of Regents, mm -hmm. Randy Moore, is an alum. Uh, president of um, the University Seton Hall in the mainland, the DOE District Superintendent Ruth Silverstein, Chief of Police Louis K. Aloha, and a number of uh, previous Chiefs of Police like Lee Donahue. Our Bishop, uh, we have a Bishop in the Pacific Islands, the head of the YWCA, Noriko Namiki. In media communications, um, the founder of the Hawaii International Film Festival, Jeanette Paulson. Our YNI video guru, Candy Suiso, and a head of a PR company. We have um, just miscellaneous people who maybe didn't, um, went on somewhere else, but attended Shamanad, such as Judge, Judge David Ezra or former U.S. Surgeon General Kenneth Moritsugu. So um, quite a few distinguished alums in a number of fields. That's amazing. I'm learning so much because um, when I first started at UH, I um, recruited for the executive MBA program mm -hmm. and we've got maybe about 400 of them in the community and they are very very special yes but um, now I see that well <laughs> you've got a great Pretty group over list. there too so. I, I have to tell you Alice one of our alums uh -huh. he was a in the US Coast Guard mm -hmm. very decorated and distinguished career he spends half of the year in England and the other half in Florida his name is Captain Winston Churchill didn't know that Winston Churchill went to Shamana, <laughs> did you? No. <laughs> I learned something new, yeah. too. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. great. Well, let's take a break here, okay. and then uh, when we come back from our break, uh, we'll continue to talk a little bit more about the alumni at Shamana University. And of course, the more important thing that I'd like to move on to is um, your role as a leader. Um, at Chaminat and in the community. So let's take a break. My guest here is Diane peters Wynn. She is the Vice President of Institutional Advancement at Chaminat University. We'll be right back. I'm Hong Jiang, host for Asia in Review on Tuesdays. And I'm David Day, host for Asian Review on Thursdays. Both of us broadcast our respective shows at 4 p.m. And my topics tend to deal with uh, questions related to the environment, culture, history, and sometimes human rights. And my shows tend to be on international business, foreign policy, geopolitics, and national security. And you can watch our shows live on the ThinkTech website at thinktechhawaii.com. And uh, you can also watch us on YouTube or Olalo. So come join us on Thursdays at 4 p.m. I'm David Day. And Ar on Tuesdays at 4 p.m., I'm Hong Jiang. Aloha. Aloha. Welcome back. My guest here is Diane peters Wynn. She's the Vice President of Institutional Advancement at Chaminade University. And we've been talking about her position and the, her responsibilities at the university. Before our break, you were giving me a very impressive list of alumni. So tell me, how have they been supportive of the university? Well, Alice, mm -hmm. our alums, as you know, have been um, very engaged. You could see from the video mm -hmm. that they come out every year to our all alumni reunion on campus. It's, it's a full week of activities and they um, love to get involved. So we have actually an advisory group that comes together for planning that. But um, so they volunteer their time and effort. There also we have a number of alums that do serve on our board of regents, uh, Dan Gu, um, a number of others. And then um, with their philanthropic support, our alums are very generous in providing financial support um, through the annual fund as well as we've had uh, alumni who have established endowed scholarships or uh, made capital gifts to support renovation of facilities and uh, they've been very generous in that way so very grateful there and then I think the final area would be their role in the community as role models. Mm -hmm. And that that is something we always try to invite those alums back to speak to our students mm -hmm. and have them see what, what their education can mean down the road. And so it's very important. One of the important, I would say, aspects of our brand is, is the service part of it. And, and we always talk about serving the community and serving others. So the in the service, 
industry, so to speak, for example, uh, the police or the, in the education fields, teachers, we really want to highlight the good work that our alums do in giving back to the community. So mm -hmm. that's an important thing that they do. Um, I know you mentioned too that one of your alums was responsible for the uh, joint program with Macau. Can you tell us about oh, that one? Oh yes, that's a wonderful, a very exciting new uh, development. So mm -hmm. we have just had the first cohort finish their first year uh, this joint MBA program with the Macau Institute of Management. Mm -hmm. And this came about really uh, one of our alums is, uh, was from the first MBA class at Chaminade. Um, Mr. Sai Chong Chui, actually a colleague of Richard Lim's who was in the same class, and he proposed to us that we get involved and do a joint MBA. So it took several years to finally put it together, but uh, the wonderful thing, he just came for a visit and, and he was telling us that this first cohort uh, actually is so well placed in, within the business community that there's kind of created this buzz in Macau about this new MBA program. So we're very excited uh, to, to launch this and it's most of it is takes place there. However, there is an online component and we're looking to at adding possibly um, a segment where, where the students would come over to Hawaii perhaps in some sort of capping mm -hmm. experience mm -hmm. or uh, something like that, but I, we have great plans and we believe this is a, another way in addition to looking as, as many of the colleges here in Hawaii are at, at international recruitment and other ways to reach out to Asia and this type of joint partnering program. And I think it's a win-win situation for the students because they broaden up their perspectives. Exactly. That's great. Yeah. Now, um, you talked about um, earlier on um, about your position, doing something matters and making a difference. Um, as a leader, you're doing that every day. Tell us about your leadership style. So I just had an opportunity. Mm. We had our, um, my team had mm. our planning retreat. And one of the things that I discussed was the fact that each and every one of them are in, on, on our team is a leader because we're the advancement group and that means we're charged very broadly with a lot of activities but we're often the face of the university out in the community and you know even in terms of recruiting new board members and, and those types of activities so I talked to my team about the idea that I think leadership um, they're often very strong managerial types who um, focus on process and they develop processes that will carry them forward and that is really important and so hard work showing up every day developing the process making sure that you've got all those things in a good strong system and then there are other leaders who are very charismatic and those leaders inspire and motivate they get people excited and they want to to, to be a part of that team uh, the, so what my argument was to my, my group is you have to have both. And so my, what I aspire, I don't know if I achieve this, but I aspire to have both of those be a strong manager as well as an inspirational leader. And, and what I had said was the, the manager is the one that makes sure you actually get it done. The inspirational person gets things started but often sometimes the follow-up isn't there or sometimes it, it's impossible to to achieve that big vision but that's why it's a constant balance and and for me um, on our team we definitely have people that play both of those roles for me as well as people outside our team in, in the other leadership capacities at the university so I it's a, something that um, you develop along the way you no one is born being a great leader. It's something that I have to work on certainly every day and I try to do that by watching the styles of other people and, and emulating those that, that I think work well. So of course the natural question after this <laughs> is who have been uh, your, your, uh, your role models then? So Alice, as we were talking about mm. before, I, I just start off with my dad. I think my parents in general were so involved in the community and particularly uh, my father in the Hawaiian community. Uh, he was always a staunch believer of education. There was never a degree that he didn't like. If I got my master's, he'd say, what about your JD? What about your MBA? What about your doctorate? <laughs> but he was a believer in getting a good education and continuing to learn all your life. He also, uh, you know, always extolled the values of working hard, 
there's no shortcuts. And also, I think his, the whole thing with my dad was, you know, you should know the guy at the top, but make sure you know the secretary and be nice to everyone because you never know, you may need their help. And so he was famous for, uh, for example, I would go with him to Rotary at the Royal Hawaiian and these ladies that refill your coffee or your tea, they loved my dad. He would greet them with a big kiss and he knew their names and, you know, he, he treated them like long lost cousins. And so we always had our coffee and tea filled up right away. But it, it's just to say that he treated everyone with respect. So I think that was a really big learning point for me. And, you know, he also believed in helping Hawaiians. So that's when, as I said earlier, when this position came around, I thought, Ooh, I'm getting to check off a lot of things on my list. Mm -hmm. Now, um, your dad is a big believer in helping. Um, you mentioned Hawaiians, but I know you also mentioned that he's involved in a lot of community work. And that comes down to you, too. So um, how do you think your role in the community and your active participation and contribution to the community help you as a leader? Wow, that's a great question. I get so much back from my community experience. Mm -hmm. So earlier we had talked about your setup here at Think Tech, mm -hmm. and I had mentioned being on the Olelo board, which I you know just turned off of. But that was such a fulfilling experience because not only working with a great group of people, a great president of Olelo, but the every single time we heard back from the community, they were thanking us for letting them have a voice and. It's providing a voice for those people that really didn't have an opportunity to speak out. So mm -hmm. young people, youth, people at, at the schools, out in the rural areas, disadvantaged areas. So I, I think, again, the, the, the types of programs. Um, I'm also on the, um, it's, it's called Pu'u uh, Vai O Pu'u Honua, and that is a, a community development entity of the under the auspices of the new market tax credit program and so that has been an interesting experience as well um, learning a lot on that that's uh, really in conjunction with Enterprise Honolulu and uh, but the, you know being on these advisory boards another one is the Friends of the East West Center mm -hmm. also the Hawaii Society for Business Professionals um, the, with the city I was the former chair of the City and County Planning Commission for, for a few years, um, currently on the Salary Commission of the City and County. So that's looking at the salary levels of the actually the mayor and the elected officials. But those, their learning experiences, their experiences um, to really give back to the community and for me to, to meet others that are out there and become more engaged. So I really treasure all of those experiences. Yesterday, I was at a seminar at East West Center um, with, um, they were doing entrepreneurship training. Um, giving back is one, um, a, a major theme, actually, uh, because a lot of this, uh, the, um, the feeling to give back um, propels a lot of these entrepreneurs, and they come from across, um, many different countries here. Mm -hmm. But then somebody also mentioned that, well, you can always give, but you always have to find time for yourself. Do you find time for yourself? I do. Uh -huh. I do. I, I've learned after many years that you have to you have to plug it in. You have to program it in. And mm -hmm. so, um, I my former passion was being out in the ocean. I still try to do that. Um, now I'm slotting in a lot more time for tennis. Uh, rediscovered tennis after being away from it for a long time. So, uh, those are the things. I for me, it's about being outdoors and having that time for myself to run around and go crazy but also family time is is for me very precious so whenever I don't have something um, having that dinner around the table is is very important and, and that's how I recharge my batteries oh that's good <laughs> now um, maybe a very quick question then um, how has your leadership evolved over the years then you know I was thinking about that mm -hmm. and I I think as a younger person mm -hmm sometimes you don't have you, either the maturity or the experience. You, you, you may be able to make the right decision, but it's, it's sometimes it's hard to explain it or it, it just, you know, it, it didn't turn out the way you thought it would. But 
as, as you get that experience, as you gain the confidence, you know what the right thing is. And then it's, it's a matter of getting everyone on board or, or it, motivating your staff in a certain direction. But I, I remember, uh, gosh, many years ago, and you know, I was probably a mid-level type uh, manager, and I took the, um, Glenn Furuya had his Leadership mm -hmm. Works course, which I still remember many of the things that, that he taught during that short, you know, like three-day session. Mm -hmm. And I practiced them over and over. And I mean, I could tell you some of the things, but one of the things I remember was, um, you know, the, the concept that, that many people are familiar with, management by walking around, that, that we all knew about. But he added to that, and I think this is especially important in Hawaii, and he talked about just sitting down and going in to one of your, um, you know, staffers' offices and saying, "Well, tell me what's going on. What's going on in your area?" An open-ended question like that to sort of get their temperature and find out what's going on. And most of the time, we're we're in a rush and we're saying, "Did you get this done? All right, I need an answer on that. What are you doing about this?" And it's very specific, but this was about going in and not having an agenda just kind of laying it out there and saying, so, what do, you, what do you think, what's going on? And then that's an opportunity for that person to kind of say, well, you know, I've been really upset about blah, blah, blah. And so I, I, don't, I don't do it as, as much as I should, but I, I hope that I've gotten better in my listening skills as, as I've matured and hopefully um, progressed as a leader. I think that's tremendously important and I think the, probably the single most thing that people who don't um, particularly admire their bosses feel that they're not listened to. At least that's what I hear. So, uh, Likewise. <laughs> I've heard of that too. And I do appreciate people who listen. Yeah. Um, yeah and I guess I, I'm trying to do that. So that's a good pointer too. Yeah. Well, we'll take a break here. And then when we come back, now you've been talking about... Um, all the incentives and the rewards of being a leader, but I know there are also challenges, so I want to ask you about that. My guest here is Diane peters Wynn. She is the Vice President of uh, Institutional Advancement at Chaminade University. We'll be right back. Okay, this is Think Tech, and one of our favorite shows is Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy. And it, it uh, goes four to five every Wednesday right here from Think Tech uh, in Pioneer Plaza at the core of downtown Honolulu. And my co-host is Ray Starling from Hawaii Energy. Ray, do you like the show? I love the show. It's, uh, it's great to see all the new people coming in with new ideas about how to save energy, get us off of fossil fuel, and that's what it's all about. So Hawaii, the state of clean energy, uh, see us on Wednesday afternoons at 4 o'clock. I knew he'd say that. Thanks, Ray. Welcome back. This is Think Tech Hawaii Biz Ed Sport Spotlight. Uh, my name is Alice Lee Hagen. My guest is Diane Peters Wynn. She is the Vice President of Institutional Advancement at Chaminade University. Before the break, we were talking to her about um, her leadership role at Chaminade University and all the rewards and joy that comes with the position. Um, of course, there are, with the leadership role, um, you are very gracious. You mentioned all the rewards that you have been um, enjoying, but there must be some challenges too. So would you like to share that with us? Well, I, I mean, I think the main challenges mm -hmm. are, are what, what all of us feel in just in terms of not enough hours in the day to do what you want to do. So that's been just to, for me, you know, it's, it's just an ongoing thing. And I try to tell those that either, um, you know, my staff or others that I work with that it's to be intentional and to be to be using your time in the best way that you can. So always for the best and highest purpose is, is what I like to say. So if you're if you're standing there and making a hundred copies and we have a student intern that is not doing anything, then then I look at that and think, well that person is not using their time well. And so for myself, I try to remind myself what the best and highest purpose is. And, and so often that means, you know, being out there and talking to our, to our donors, to our supporters, to our board members and our leadership. And so, um, but, but you're right, it, 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 you know, at the end of the day, that, that can be exhausting. So challenges are just 
in you know my own ability to do it all and to find the time to do everything and um, there's a, it there's always more that you can do so those are the challenges but but again I think we are blessed Chaminade is a little college we're not huge like the University of Hawaii mm -hmm. the opportunity that that offers us it means that we don't have a big bureaucracy there's no bureaucracy so basically um, we have a very small leadership team there I am one of two vice presidents actually both of us are women mm -hmm. and coincidentally both of us are Kamehameha graduates oh. but uh, we there's a, a provost which is our she's our chief academic officer so three uh, right under the president and there's no bureaucracy so going from making a decision to implementing it it is you know it doesn't require the legislature approving something it doesn't it's it's very easy to to move very quickly and so I think that that is the advantage now the disadvantage um, the probably the biggest challenge is that we're very thinly staffed mm -hmm. and so we all wear lots of different hats and so in order to take on um, a new project it's it's finding room and space on the plate so, or moving something aside so that that is again part of the challenges but. well um, based on what you just said I guess I like to um, this brings in the gender question or issue because um, I always hear that as a woman, um, we take on a lot and we know how to multitask. Um, then, uh, let's see, I guess the question is um, for you as a, as a woman and as a leader, um, how, how do you think uh, that makes a difference? Um, and I guess the reason I ask this is uh, four years ago, I think, uh, it, um, there was a survey done, and of course, we know that there are not as many women on uh, as executives. Yes. And uh, I think that was actually in the Hawaii Business Magazine a couple of years ago, and they uh, there was a survey that said only 14% of executives in the executive levels are women. Even though in Hawaii we haven't had a maybe systematic way of uh, doing a survey like this, but they were saying based on the Black Book List published by Hawaii Business Magazine, I think there's one uh, one woman to every four men in the nonprofit sector, and if you take the nonprofit sector out, there's only one woman to five men um, in the uh, in the private sector. So, what are the challenges for you? Well, you're right, Alice. I, I think there is still a huge issue in, in the area of gender gap, and, mm -hmm. and I would say um, that higher education is actually a very promising place for women, and, and here's why. There is uh, a trend that has been actually increasing over the years of, in terms of the number of young women who are enrolled in colleges and universities, so where, um, especially in private institutions and private colleges, it's about 60% female oh. and to 40% male. Um, in At Chaminade, it's even more pronounced, about 68% of our students are female. But not only do are, are there more young women in college, they also outperform their male counterparts. So they do better academically, mm -hmm. and also their graduation rates are higher. So starting with that platform I think there's a lot of hope now there still is a um, gender inequity a pronounced inequity I would say even in um, higher ed administration that um, you know not quite maybe as severe as some of the numbers that you just shared but certainly there is one but I again at Chaminade I you know we Chaminade was the first university to appoint a woman president our late president Sue Wessel Camper first one in Hawaii to have a female president. Mm -hmm. Also, as I mentioned, our two vice presidents and our chief academic officer, also women. Also, um, within our leadership mm -hmm. our council, which is our uh, president's leadership council, it's like his cabinet, we have nine of 12 of us are women. Oh, yeah. that's so, impressive. So I, I'd say that um, I'm in a very good environment and um, I, I think you'll find pockets like that in, in Hawaii. There's certain industries. Perhaps healthcare is another industry. I should have mentioned one of our stellar alums who is the, the head of Kapi'olani Hospital, Martha B. Smith, 
Oh. So, again, there there are uh, ways that it's it's so wonderful to see a woman succeed in, in an industry like the automotive industry where someone would climb to the top. But um, it, we know that there are not many of those. We need to see more of those, and and we need to do what we can to help help the younger ones break those, um, you know, shatter those glass ceilings. Well, um, so what advice? Well, uh, let me backtrack. Um, you are very successful leaders, so um, if you think back, are there a few things that you wish you had known back then and something that you could share with, uh, I guess, younger women who are aspiring to be leaders? You know, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. I think I was extremely fortunate because I got to travel the world as I was growing up. Mm -hmm. And also, I didn't have uh, television for most of the years when I was growing up, and much less computer, of course. <laughs> so I didn't grow up with a screen in front of me. And I think of, I have two wonderful sons, 12 and 17, but I think about their experiences and so many of our young people are doing everything vicariously. They're living through, you know, these these things that they see on the screens and they're not, they're not outdoors, they're not experiencing real life things. And so just to be um, walking on the beach or, or catching a wave inside a tube or something like that, it, it tends to pale in comparison with these very highly stimulating experiences that they're having with the computer. And so in, I would kind of turn that around and say, I was so fortunate to be in an environment where I had to use my imagination. We didn't have a lot of toys. Um, I was in, uh, fortunate to be in environments hearing different languages, seeing different sites, different cultures, different peoples. I, I worry that our young people are more and more insular in the sense of they only, we only know English, Americans only speak English. We, we don't get outside our country. We don't even get outside the house as much anymore. Young people are, you know, constantly the screen time. You have to take it away, have them have real experiences, have a real conversation, have everyone at dinner put away the phones, turn off the TV, all the screens. So I guess for young people today, I would just challenge them um, this is think tech, so maybe this isn't politically correct, but I'd say sometimes you got to unplug and have a real conversation. But that's really, really hard, though. I guess I have a 13-year-old. Yes, it's so hard to get them to unplug. Um, but there is, as you said, so much to experience in the world. And um, the language, I think um, we've been fortunate. We, well, I had to learn English, and now I realize, oh, it's great that I speak Chinese, too. So. How do you encourage them to do that? Take on a different language, go see the world. It's, you know, it's something that I think continue, it starts when they're very young. Mm. So my, my sense is that there's a short window in there before they start thinking, oh, that's not cool, I don't want to do that. So whether it's taking your kids to, um, you know, a, a Chinese festival or um, exposing them to different cultural things or where, where they're going to hear different languages, you know, even just going to Chinatown, but having an open mind and then discussing those things as a family and talking about different cultures with, with your family. And so I think young people um, need to try to expose them as much as they can take advantage of these opportunities and seek them out instead of, you know, there's a lot of time people spend watching TV, watching shows, and we're all guilty of it. But I, I just think that, that if young people are interested in, in really having that success in the sense of, of being able to achieve something, that they need to think beyond, you know, the screen. <laughs> Absolutely, they do. Um, thank you so much, You're Diane. That has been a very interesting conversation. Um, my guest here is Diane peters -Wynn. She is the Vice President of Institutional Advancement at Chaminade University. We have been talking about her leadership role at the university and advice for young people, uh, especially those who are aspiring to become leaders. Thanks for joining us here at Think Tech Hawaii. Stay tuned for next week's show on fascinating and interesting issues that matter to our island state, business, and higher education. See you then.